Here we're going to continue our discussion about uh, phase equilibria. In particular, we're going to consider the detailed thermodynamics of Raoult's law. Now, uh, if you remember from last lecture, uh, we decided uh, to study phase equilibria. And we said that uh, typically what one does is make a pressure temperature diagram and put out points of interest like a critical point, triple point, gas, liquid, so, uh, sorry, solid, liquid, and gas. And we consider that in detail for a single component. And we said for a single component, a single pure substance, we have two degrees of freedom. And we generalize this to the Gibbs phase rule, where the degrees of freedom is equal to the number of components minus the number of phases that you want to be in phase equilibrium plus two. All right, and then for a single component, for C is equal to one, and you want any phase, uh, you doesn't have to be any phase equilibria. This implies that your degrees of freedom was equal to two, and we said the two degrees of freedom are temperature and pressure. We can independently specify temperature and pressure, and once we specify those, then we know what the phase is. Uh, so phase equal one. If, on the other hand, we have a single component, and we want the number of phases to be equal to two, for instance, liquid and solid to coexist, that means the degrees of freedom equals one, and so on. Well, now in this lecture, what we're going to consider are two component systems where you have uh, just not a single pure substance, but now you have two components. Well, the degrees of freedom for this system are the number of components, which is two, the number of phases. Let's take in general, uh, we have two phases um, that, or sorry, uh, two phases that can exist anywhere. And, um, so <laughs> we have four minus the number of phases. So if we just want a single phase, we're not going to put any phase restrictions, then the degrees of freedom will be three. So here we have two degrees of freedom. This is the x and y axis. Now with uh, two components and no uh, phase equilibria, which means that the number of phases can be equal to one, so we have no constraints, then we have the degrees of freedom will equal three, so really what we need is a three-dimensional graph. So along one axis will be pressure, along the other axis will be temperature, but that third axis, this will be, say, mole fraction of the first component, or it could be mole fraction of the second component, you don't need a fourth axis because the mole fraction of the two components have to sum to one. So in general, for two components, we need a three-dimensional graph. So typically what one does is to plot it at constant uh, temperature, which corresponds to planes intersecting the temperature axis. And therefore, you have a two-dimensional graph pressure versus composition, and usually it's the mole fraction of, uh, you know, some substance for substance. Or you can have constant pressure that corresponds to planes across intersecting at right angles with the pressure axis. In that case, you would plot temperature versus composition. So you have pressure composition or temperature composition. Now for the first part of this uh, considerations where you have two components, we'll consider pressure um, comp uh, composition graphs. So now, um, so in general, that's what we'll have. We'll just have slices in this three-dimensional graph where you have three degrees of freedom. We'll restrain uh, one of the degrees of freedom. We'll get rid of it by saying constant temperature pressure, and therefore you have these two graphs. Now, if we want to put in a phase equilibrium, uh, typically uh, 1 and 2 here, the subscripts 1 and 2, uh, represent the two components. And this is the chemical potential in phase 1 of component 1, 
we equal the chemical potential of component 1 in phase 2 and a similar expression for component 2. So now these are constraints and if we put these constraints in equilibrium for phase diagrams we're going to reduce the degrees of freedom. Um, and, okay, So let's see um, in more detail what we're talking about here. Uh, suppose we have a sealed system here and let's take a single component and this will be a liquid. All right, so here we have a single component. We'll denote that with the uh, one, which we're eventually going to put as a subscript. And this will be in the liquid phase. But as we know, at equilibrium, the liquid will be in equilibrium uh, with the va vapor. It'll have a certain vapor pressure. Liquids usually have vapor pressure in the gas phase. So if we want phase equilibrium for a single system, remember we're going to reduce our degrees of freedom by one. So instead of a two-dimensional plane, we now have just a single line we have to follow. We said that the chemical potential of uh, component one in the liquid phase at phase equilibrium has to equal the chemical potential of component one in the gas phase. This is at phase equilibrium. All right, well, let's uh, develop this. Let's look at thermodynamically in more detail what's happening here. We're eventually going to, we're just looking at the single component. And then once we understand that, we'll add another component here. All right, so uh, the chemical potential of component one in the liquid phase will be the chemical potential of component one in the liquid phase, standard state, plus RT, times the natural log of the activity of component one in the liquid phase. The same way with component one in the gas phase, that's equal to the chemical potential of component one in the gas phase, standard state, plus RT times the natural log of the activity of component one in the gas phase. All right, now as we said for condensed phases such as water and liquid or water solid for solids and liquids, the activity of the condensed phase, which we have, if we're just looking at the liquid, that's a condensed phase, and we have a single component, so it's pure, the activity of the liquid phase, in this particular case, we have a single component, will be equal to one. And the activity of the gas phase, remember the activity, say of component one in the gas phase, that will be equal to the pressure in the gas phase uh, divided by the pressure at some standard state uh, times some fugacity constant for the first one. Let's assume that we have an ideal solution so that this is just the pressure of component one divided by the P0. That's what the activity is. I'm oh, sorry, not this would be su should be subscript zero for standard state. Sorry about that. And let us denote further that the substance will put a star up there. That star means that we're doing a single component, and um, the single component is pure. So this will be the vapor pressure of the pure component above the solution. So that's what that is. Vapor pressure of the pure uh, component. That's what that star means there. All right, so we have an expression for the chemical potential in the liquid, the chemical potential in the gas phase, and at phase equilibrium, the chemical potentials are equal. All right, so with that, uh, let's equate these two. At, f at equilibrium, they're equal. So on the next page here, we'll equate those two. So the chemical potential of liquid is the chemical potential of liquid in the standard state. So you note that, uh, sorry, this term goes to zero. So the chemical potential of liquid is the chemical potential of liquid standard state. Well, that sort of makes sense because it's a pure substance. Uh, and so that is equal to uh, the chemical potential in the gas phase. So this is component one in the liquid phase, component one in the gas phase. 
standard state plus RT times the natural log of the vapor pressure, the pure substance, divided by the standard state pressure. All right, that's interesting. It relates the chemical potential of the liquid, standard state chemical potential liquid, to the standard state in the gas, plus this sort of correction term because uh, you don't have uh, the vapor pressure above the liquid to be equal to the standard state one atmosphere usually. All right, so that's, um, remember that equation, that'll come in handy a little bit later. Now we're going to extend the thermodynamic analysis now to two components. All right, so let's draw a picture there. Picture's worth a thousand words. Okay, so here's our box. We'll have component one, which is an equilibrium in the, in the liquid. Here's component one in the gas phase. We'll now have a second component, which is a liquid down here. This will also be an equilibrium with component uh, two in the gas phase. Okay, so what we have now with these two components is that the chemical potential of one in the liquid phase is equal to the chemical potential of one in the gas phase. That's at equilibrium. This, by the way, is at phase equilibrium. Okay. And chemical potential component two in the liquid phase will be equal to the chemical potential component two in the gas phase. That's what we mean by phase equilibrium. Now, um, well, just let's go ahead and uh, put some expressions in here. So uh, let's just do it uh, first for the uh, component one. So the chemical potential component one, uh, sorry, that shouldn't be a zero. And let's just do the liquid phase here. Uh, hmm. In the liquid phase, that will be the chemical potential of one in the liquid phase, standard state, plus RT times the natural log of the activity of one in the liquid phase. Now for a pure component, the activity was one. But now since we have two components, the activity in the liquid phase is no longer one. In fact, it's uh, the mole fraction of one, we'll find out, or we already know. And then the uh, chemical potential of one in the gas phase is a chemical potential of one in the gas phase at the standard state, plus RT uh, times the natural log of the activity, but just let's go ahead and assume we have ideal um, solutions and so on, the pressure divided by the standard state pressure. Now, this is no longer um, the st the pressure of the pure component. Why? Well, it's not a pure component anymore. We have two components. So this differs from what we developed before. However, we do know that the chemical potential of um, the standard state chemical potentials of the liquid is the standard state chemical potential of the gas plus this. So this ha for standard states here, and this is a pure substance. So we can go ahead and substitute in for this uh, standard state chemical potential of the liquid into there. And then, of course, at phase equilibrium, we're going to equate these. So let me go ahead and substitute in for there what well, we had the expression on the other one so that um, the chemical potential of the liquid in standard state is the chemical potential uh, of component one in standard state plus RT times the natural log of the pressure of one, pure one, vapor pressure of pure substance, divided by the standard state, plus RT times the natural log of the activity of one in the liquid state. So we just substitute in what the standard state uh, for one liquid was. That's what that was. That is equal to the standard state chemical potential uh, of one in the gas phase plus RT times the natural log of the pressure in the mixture, not the pure substance, but the mixture, divided by the standard state. How convenient these cancel out. Let's put, um, let's see, let's put, uh, I'll put this term over there. So we have RT times the natural log of the activity of one in the liquid phase is equal to RT times the natural log, let's say I have this one, 
and I'm subtracting this one so it'll be P1 over P1 uh, sorry P0 that's what that is but when I subtract that that will go down in the uh, denominator so this would be P1 star divided by P0 all well, the P zeros cancel out so this is just equal to RT times the natural log of the pressure above the solution in the mixture divided by the pressure above the solution in the um, pure pure state. That's the star there. And if RT log of A equals RT log of this, this implies that the activity of substance 1 in the liquid phase is equal to the pressure of 1 divided by the pressure of 1 if it were pure. So if you have pure substance the vapor pressure, uh, the pressures here will be equal, the activity be 1 for a pure liquid. And if you have less than a uh, hundred percent, if you have less than uh, um, pure substance, you dilute it out by adding something else and the vapor pressure goes down and the activity will go down just by this ratio. Alright, or let's rewrite this um, so remember, we said that uh, the activity of a liquid can be written as the activity coefficient. Let's say let's continue using, say, uh, st component one. So let's say the activity of component one in the liquid phase is equal to the activity of component one times the mole fraction of component one in the liquid phase. So this is mole fraction concentration unit of component 1 in the liquid phase. So let's assume that gamma 1 is equal to 1 so we have an ideal solution so the activity of component 1 in the liquid phase is just the mole fraction of 1 and we use x for mole fraction in a liquid phase a little while long a little while long along in this lecture we use y for com, uh, mole fraction in the vapor phase so this is the liquid phase so if that's true okay look at this we can just replace that so the mole fraction of one is equal to the pressure of one above the solution which has two components divided by the uh, vapor pressure of pure a a pure component one and this is the actual pressure a uh, pressure in, above mixture so what does this mean this means the this is a solution concentration The solution concentration, mole fraction, governs the ratio of the vapor phase, the uh, pressure, the partial, or the fraction of pressure in the vapor phase. Or another way to, to write that is that the pressure above a solution is equal to the mole fraction in the liquid, not above the, in the solution, times the vapor pressure of pure solution. This is known as Raoult's law. Raoult's law. And usually that is uh, just given to you in introductory chemistry, but here we derived it using the fact that we had phase equilibrium. Well, that's kind of neat. So let's go touch base with our slides here. So where are we? Uh, yeah, so for two uh, liquids, each having a vapor pressure, so the fig I'll show you the figure in the next slide, we have Raoult's law. Okay, so just let's look at this. All right, let's go a little bit further. Let's go where no person has gone before, except a million other people who have studied PCAM. Uh, let's assume we have ideal gases, so we can use Dalton's law. So Dalton's law says the total pressure in a mixture of gases is equal to the partial pressures, and we just have two components, so it'll be the partial pressure of component one plus the partial pressure of component two. That's okay for ideal gases. So we know that the partial pressure of a component one is the mole fraction uh, times the vapor pressure of pure component one 
And you could just go through the same derivation and substitute 1 or 2 for 1, and you get this, the mole fraction of 2 times the vapor pressure of a pure 2. So, you know, anything we did here for 1, just change a 2 and you'll get the exact same thing. All right, we know that um, the mole fraction of 1 plus the mole fraction of 2 will equal 1. So let's get rid of mole fraction 2. Mole fraction 2 is 1 minus mole fraction 1. So the total pressure can be written as mole fraction 1 times the vapor pressure of pure 1 plus 1 minus the mole fraction of 1 times the vapor pressure of pure 2. Or the total pressure is equal to uh, the mole fraction, or sorry, the partial of uh, the vapor pressure of pure 1 minus the vapor pressure of pure 2 times the mole fraction of component 1 plus the vapor pressure of pure 2. So look, if you plot total pressure versus mole fraction 1, you should get a straight line, uh, and we'll see that in just a minute. And if you plot the individual pressures, like the pressure of 1 versus mole fraction of 1, you'll get a straight line. And those kinds of straight lines that you get when you do those plots, if they are straight lines, then the solution follows Raoult's law. Okay, so let's take a, a look at a, a plot of those things. Here we have um, a, a plot of Root's Law. Notice they're all straight lines. What we're plotting here is vapor pressure uh, of A or B in the solution as a function, and this we're changing notation here, sorry, I should have got another graph. Uh, a and B correspond to components 1 and 2 uh, that we had uh, in our derivations. But what you're doing is plotting here vapor pressure of A or B as a function of concentration of B or concentration of A. Note that A plus B, since there are only two components, they have to add to one. All right, let's look at this. Here we have total pressure and as we predicted, the total pressure is a linear function of the mole fraction. All right, so here's the mole fraction of B goes from zero to one. There's that linear function, that's total pressure. Let's look at individual partial pressures. Individual partial pressures uh, just are linear, uh, or proportional actually, with the proportionality constant mole fraction. So just let's take a look at that. So these are the individual pressures. Yeah, they're linear also. So when you see a plot like this, you'd say that the mixture you're looking at, uh, the two liquid components, both of which have uh, contribute to the vapor pressure above the solution, they follow Raoult's law. So a little bit closer. So here we have uh, the mole fraction of B is 0 and the mole fraction of A is 1. So here you have pure A and out here where the mole fraction of B is 1, here you have pure B. And this starts at 0. So when you have uh, pure A, you have no B, so the line of B starts at 0. And you have pure A, so this will be the vapor pressure of pure A, which in our notation you put a little star up there. So there's a vapor pressure pure A. As you increase the concentration of B and decrease the concentration of A, the pressure of A decreases linearly all the way down to 0, where you don't have any more A and all B. And the pressure of B, which started at 0 when you didn't have any, will linearly increase all the way up to the partial pressure of B or the vapor pressure of pure B. That's our star there. So that's uh, how you would read a Root's Law kind of plot. Important equation. Now what else do we want to do with this kind of things? Well, uh, it would be kind of nice uh, if here we have the uh, pressure, uh, total pressure here pressure total is a function of the mole fraction in the liquid. It'd be useful, uh, and maybe we'll see in just a minute why it's useful, to have the total pressure 
as a function of not the mole fraction in the liquid, but the mole fraction of the components in the vapor. Okay, so uh, what we want, or what we're going to look for, is um, the total pressure is some function of, and we'll use the symbol Y, this will be the mole fraction of component 1 in the vapor, vapor above the solution. So uh, let's see if we can uh, somehow relate what we just derived uh, to this function here, something that's related to the function of the mole fraction in the vapor. So how are we going to do that? Well, it'd be nice, to, uh, here we have the total pressure as a function of the mole fraction in the liquid. And we want to take the total pressure and express it in terms of mole fraction in the vapor phase. So it'd be nice to have a relationship between mole fraction in liquid and mole fraction in vapor. So let's recall from Dalton's law that the mole fraction in vapor, remember we're using Y to give mole fraction in vapor this of component one, will be equal to the pressure of component 1 divided by the total pressure and that can be written as the pressure component 1 divided by the pressure component 1 plus the pressure component 2. So here we use Dalton's law assuming the gases are ideal. Now we're going to use Raoult's law to say that the mole fraction or the pressure of component 1 is the mole fraction in the liquid times the pressure of the pure component divided by the mole fraction in the liquid times the pressure pure plus the mole fraction in the liquid times the pressure of pure. So there we go. We've related the mole fractions in the vapor phase to the mole fractions in the liquid phase. Let's rearrange this equation to express the mole fraction in the liquid phase in terms of mole fraction in the vapor phase because we already have uh, here x1 so we want to substitute in for x1 uh, something that contains y1 and then we could um, uh, go ahead and get that expression that we want how to uh, relate um, uh, x1 to or y, how, uh, how y is a function of x all right, so let's uh, take this bottom here, multiply it on both sides so it comes over there. I don't know if this is useful. Email me if you find this useful <clears throat> to actually work these things out. So Y1, so we're multiplying by the denominator there. So this would be P1 star minus P2 star. And this would be uh, X1 plus uh, P2 star. And this whole thing, Y1 was multiplied by that whole thing. That's equal to uh, x1 p1 star. Again, what we want is an expression x1 equals something. So let's see, multiply this through. So we have x1, and then we have, uh, let's see, the component there will be p1 star minus p2 star times y1 plus y1 p2 star that's equal to x1 p1 star put this over we're isolating terms for x1 put that over there put that over there so we have x1 we have p1 star minus p2 star uh, times y1 minus x1 p1 star that's equal to y1 p2 star I don't know if this is very useful collect terms in uh, x1 so x1 so we have P1 star minus P2 star times Y1 minus P1 star <laughs> equals a Y1 P2 star, or in other words, X1 is equal to Y1 P2 star divided by <clears throat> this thing here. And so let's call that, um, I forgot that minus sign. So when you put the Y1 over there, there's a minus sign there, a minus sign there. So minus over P1 star minus P2 star uh, Y1 minus P1 star. And let's uh, multiply top and bottom by minus 1 because that's what everybody does. Y1 P2 star 
divided by, here we got P2 star minus P1 star times Y1 plus P1 star. There we go. So now we have X1, the mole fraction in the liquid, expressed as a function of Y1, the mole fraction in the vapor. Okay, now what do you want to do? Well, <clears throat> Well, I suppose we could take this expression for x1 and go ahead and substitute in this um, and so on, but that wouldn't be very useful. I think there's an easy way to do this. Um, let's recognize that the uh, pressure above the solution is uh, the mole fraction uh, of a component, do component 1 here for now, component 1 in the liquid phase times the vapor pressure uh, of that component pure. And also the pressure above the solution is equal to the mole fraction, or sorry, the vapor pressure above the solution is mole fraction in that times the total pressure. So it's uh, Rhodes Law and Dalton's Law. So we equate these two so that the um, amount uh, in the liquid times the vapor pressure, pure liquid, is equal to the amount in the vapor times the a total pressure above the solution. So the total pressure above the solution is equal to the mole fraction in the solution divided by the mole fraction in the vapor phase times the vapor phase of pure one. All right, so here we have the total pressure. Remember what we wanted was the total pressure as a function of the vapor, uh, the concentration or the mole fraction in the vapor phase. And we now have expression for AX1, uh, that's this. It's a function of that. So we take this and substitute this in here. That will get rid of x1 in terms of y1. And then uh, we'll be able to express the total pressure in terms of the vapor, uh, the mole fraction in the vapor phase. So let's just forge on ahead for there. So what was x1? I forgot already. It's, uh, yeah, this one here. So I'm going to substitute for x1 there which is, uh, let me see, I got my notes here. I'll just take it from my notes. Yes, okay, so this is Y1 times the vapor pressure of pure 2 divided by the uh, vapor pressure of pure 2 minus the vapor pressure of pure 1 uh, times Y1. Ah, make that a little clear here. plus the vapor pressure of pure one. Okay, I think that was right. P2 minus P1, yes. So I substitute for X1 and then divide this whole thing by uh, Y1 and this is X1 so I have to multiply by P1 star, okay? And uh, so finally uh, we get the total pressure. Uh, let's see what we can do here. Well, um, Y1's cancel out, P1, P2, so this is equal to the total pressure, or the vapor pressure pure 1, vapor pressure pure 2, divided by the vapor pressure pure 1 plus the vapor pressure pure 2 minus the vapor pressure pure 1 times y1. Okay, there, finally we have it. So uh, let's, this is the total vapor pressure as a function of um, the vapor, the uh, composition of the vapor. And just remember that the, we found the total vapor pressure was also equal to um, uh, the vapor pressure pure uh, 1 minus the vapor pressure of pure 2 times the mole fraction of 1 plus the uh, vapor pressure of pure 2. All right, so there's the vapor pressure as a function of the mole fraction in the liquid, and here's the vapor pressure as a function of the mole fraction in the vapor. Now note they're different. This is linear. Raoult's law, this is Raoult's law, says that the total pressure is linear with the mole fraction in the solution. But it's not linear for the mole fraction in the vapor. Okay, 
So what does that mean? Well, let's just take a look here. So let's look at the total pressure as a function of, uh, say, mole fraction of 1. So initially it's 0. And uh, so there'll be some mole fraction here. And we'll make it the usual thing here, linear. So that's as a function of a function of the mole fraction in the liquid. But the mole fraction in the vapor is different. It's like this. So this is then a function of the mole fraction in the vapor. This is called the bubble point line. And this down here is called the dew point line. Okay, I have a better picture of it here. Uh, so it's Wikipedia. So this is the bubble point line here. Uh, this is, um, well, this is benzene and something else here, but just consider two components. So there's the uh, bubble point line. This is when you have uh, this benzene, so no benzene, 0% benzene. This is the um, vapor pressure of the pure other thing. And now as you increase the composition or the benzene uh, concentration to a mole fraction of 1, you got a linear increase in the total pressure. Okay, The dew point curve, on the other hand, this is um, the composition of, benz of benzene in the vapor. It goes up like this. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Oh, we still have black here. Let's suppose, again, this is constant. Remember, constant T. So remember, we had three degrees of freedom way back at the beginning of this lecture. Temperature, pressure, and composition, we're holding con temperature constant. And let's say, go across this line here at constant pressure. Our constant temperature, and at this particular pressure, this is the composition of the um, of the liquid. Oh, phooey. And uh, this is the composition in the vapor. And this then would be the liquid. All right, so uh, what typically is happening at a particular pressure and a particular temperature, you'll have an equilibrium mixture of uh, an equilibrium uh, between the two phases of the two components. The two phases are liquid and gas. And the composition of the gas will be favorably um, enriched in the compound that's more volatile, the one that has the higher vapor pressure. So if you have, say, a 50-50 mixture of two components in the solution, but one of them has a higher vapor pressure, then the vapor composition will not be 50-50. It'll be weighted toward the one that is more volatile, the one that has a higher vapor pressure. 50-50 mixture in the liquid will give you not a 50-50 in the, in the vapor phase. So that's the whole point of all this uh, mathematical derivation to, to show that the vapor phase composition will be different from the liquid uh, composition. The only case when those will be equal is when the two liquid components have the same vapor pressure. OK, well, let's do a couple of examples. Uh, this is an example out of the Ball textbook. It's uh, 7.9. Uh, what is the activity of water in a solution when the vapor pressure of water is 748.2 millimeter mercury at 100 C and at 1 atmosphere pressure? And assume the activity coefficient of water is 1, everything's um, and, and uh, ideal. Oh, I guess I'm still black here. And uh, ideal uh, solutions. So we don't have to worry about activity coefficients or fugosity coefficients. All right, so let's see if we can see the activity of water. All right, picture is probably worth something here. So again, we're going to draw our box. And down here, we have some water. 
which is a liquid, and up here we have water, which is in the gas phase. And note that I draw this as an enclosed box. Uh, I do that so that you'll have some sort of equilibrium going up and down here. If you just keep boiling the water and there's no constraint here, the water will all boil away like on the top of the stove. So I'm emphasizing here and you have some sort of equilibrium established. All right, well, uh, this is at 100 degrees C and is at one atmosphere. Now, what is the vapor pressure of pure water? 100 degrees C. Well, 100 degrees C is the um, is the normal boiling point of water. Normal boiling point implies a boiling point when the uh, atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. So this implies that the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees C is one atmosphere. So if you had pure water down here and you were at the boiling point at, at uh, 100 degrees, the vapor pressure of water would be one atmosphere. It would be boiling, in other words, at equilibrium. Now if we go back to the problem, at 100 degrees, one atmosphere, you don't have one, uh, sorry, 100 degrees, you don't have uh, the vapor pressure of water being um, 760 millimeters, one atmosphere. Instead, you have it 748. That means that the activity of water is less than one. If it were one, you'd have pure water, and it would be at 100 degrees, and it's boiling. Um, at one atmosphere, you'd have pure water be boiling at one atmosphere. I hope I made that uh, clear. <clears throat> All right, so we're assuming uh, gamma is equal to one and so on. So the pressure um, <clears throat> of uh, water in the solution is equal to the mole fraction of water in the solution times the vapor pressure of pure water in the solution. And we know at 100 degrees this is one atmosphere. That's the vapor pressure of pure water at 100 degrees. It boils under one atmosphere. We also know that the activity of water will be the activity coefficient of water times the mole fraction of water. And that's, we're saying the activity coefficient equal to 1. That'd just be the mole fraction of water. So the activity of water would be the vapor pressure. Uh, so the activity of water, or the mole fraction of water, is the vapor pressure of water divided by the vapor pressure pure water. So the vapor pressure of water in that solution over the vapor pressure of water pure. The vapor pressure given in the problem, uh, 748.2 millimeter mercury. The vapor pressure of pure water at 100 degrees, that's when it's boiling, is 760 millimeter mercury so that the activity of water in that solution is 0 0.9845. We'll put uh, four significant figures, I guess. All right, so that's how you calculate activities, just as the ratio of the pressure divided by the, uh, above the solution, divided by the pressure if the solution were pure water. All right, let's uh, do this one. What's the mole fraction of ethanol in blood? if the vapor pressure in breath is uh, 0.07 millimeter mercury. Okay, let's go back and uh, take a look there. Well, what we have here is we have a, um, down here we have blood, and up here we have lungs. So the lungs, there's no I in lungs, um, we'll consider just as um, Anything up here is in vapor, and anything down here is in solution. And what we have is ethanol uh, in the liquid phase uh, is in equilibrium with ethanol in the gas phase. And let's assume there's phase equilibrium, so we have a dynamic equilibrium. Ethanol is going into the liquid, and ethanol in liquid is going into the gas, back and forth. So the mole fraction of uh, ethanol in the liquid phase, that's that X, is equal to the pressure of ethanol above the solution divided by the pressure of ethanol, P 
pure. All right, so what was the pressure? It is 0.07 millimeter mercury. The pure stuff is 115.5. So uh, this is 0.07 millimeter mercury. The pure stuff is 115.5. So the um, the mole fraction in above the solution is 6 times 10 to the minus 4th. No mole fraction has no units. All right. Uh, for added uh, interest here, uh, this is how breathalyzers work. They assume that there's phase equilibrium between ethanol in your lungs, uh, sorry, ethanol in your blood, and ethanol in the lungs. So if they figure out what the concentration is here when you blow in a breathalyzer, then they can extrapolate and figure out what the concentration was in blood. We just figured out what the concentration in blood was. It's 6 times 10 to the minus 4th. That's in units of mole fraction. So what is the, uh, let's see if somebody blows this, um, whether the person is considered legally uh, uh, drunk and cannot drive a, um, a vehicle. Well, the, uh, it's called the blood alcohol content. If it's greater than a certain amount, then you're considered uh, drunk. And, by, uh, and you can't operate a motorcycle um, or a car. For blood alcohol content, it has to be greater than 0 0.08 if you're over a 21. It has to be 0, 0.00 if you're under 21. In other words, there's no tolerance for drinking. If you're under 21 and you're drinking and you drive a car, no matter what your blood alcohol content is, you could be arrested for DUI. All right, but if you're over 21, you're allowed somehow something magic happens at 21 and you're allowed to drink, but you can only drink up to a blood alcohol content of 0 0.08. What does this mean, 0 0.08? All right, 0 0.08 is 0 0.08 percent uh, uh, by volume. Okay, that's what that 0 0.08 means, 0 0.08 percent by volume. Now this is mole fraction, so we'll have to do a unit conversion to see if somebody blows this in these units is actually uh, legally drunk and should not be driving uh, actually, you shouldn't be driving if you have a lower. 0.08 is pretty high. I don't know if you ever uh, done that, but uh, you probably don't want to operate a motor vehicle if you're 0 0.08. But anyway, um, so let's let's do a unit conversion. So remember, mole fraction is a mole. In this case, mole of ethanol divided by total moles. And let's assume the blood is all water. So this would be mole of ethanol uh, plus mole of water. And let's assume that the ethanol concentration is small enough, so this would just be mole of water. So we look at this ratio. Um, and let's convert that uh, to, um, uh, to volume percent. So we have, uh, what do we say, uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 4th mole of ethanol per mole of water and let's multiply by the conversions here we got 46 gram per mole that's the molar mass of ethanol so I prefer the gram and then we're going to divide that by the density uh, 0.789 gram per milliliter so that'll give us the volume of ethanol and if we have a mole of water uh, we multiply by, um, convert it to uh, grams, 18 gram per mole, and divide it by the density of water, which is 1 gram per milliliter. So there's a conversion. That'll give you uh, the, mil the volume of ethanol divided by the volume of uh, water. You put that into computer, you get, or into a calculator, you get 0 0.002 and that is equal to 0 0.2 percent so this is if you blow this 
do not drive. You're actually very drunk and probably near passing out. All right, well, anyway, that's sort of a digression. Thought you might be interested in that. Uh, let's look at this. Here's another example. Um, this is actually for introductory chemistry. Uh, you should know how to do this already, but nonetheless, we'll go ahead and do it. Uh, well, we have um, this example in ball. Actually, problem in ball. What is the total vapor pressure above a solution that contains hexane and cyclohexane? Gives the amount of grams of those two compounds. The vapor pressures give the vapor pressures of pure substances. Assume ideal behavior. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and do that. Um, so the total vapor pressure, that's what we want, is equal to the mole fraction of hexane times the vapor pressure of pure hexane plus the mole fraction of cyclohexane times the vapor pressure of pure cyclohexane. The mole fraction of hexane, well actually we don't, can't do that quite yet. Uh, let's do the um, a number of moles of hexane. That will be the uh, grams of hexane, uh, 21.55 gram. The molar mass of hexane, 86.18 gram per mole. So this is 0.25 mole of hexane. Do the same thing for cyclohexane. The mass given to the problem was uh, 64.14 gram divided by the molar mass is, of cyclohexane is uh, 84.16 um, gram per mole. Number of moles of hexane 0 0.762 of cyclohexane. So the mole fraction of hexane is the moles of hexane divided by the total moles and that comes out to be about 0.25 to two significant figures and similarly the moles of cyclohexane you do that or just subtract this only two components so 1 minus 0.25 is 0.75 so there's your mole fractions the vapor pressure of the pure substances was given in the problem so the total pre, uh, pressure is equal to, uh, let's see what we're doing, uh, point, uh, the mole fraction of hexane, 0.25, times the vapor pressure of pure hexane, given the problem, 151.4 millimeter mercury, plus the mole fraction of cyclohexane, which is 0.75, times the vapor pressure of pure hexane, given the problem 77.6 millimeter mercury. So the total pressure comes out to be 96 millimeter mercury. All right, so that should be familiar. Maybe you remember that from introductory chemistry. Now, what are the mole fraction of hexane and cyclohexane in the vapor? Oh, well, just let's see here. Uh, this uh, is the total pressure and we use the mole fractions in the solution. So what are the mole fractions in the vapor? Well, we go back, uh, I'll just show you what we did here. Somewhere here we had, uh, way back when the lecture, seems like so long ago. Um, and uh, it's coming up and here it is, it's coming here. I guess we just, uh, yeah. Be nice if we could solve this equation for y1 as a function of x1. I guess we didn't do that. Uh, let's see if we can do that. Um, actually, no, we do have that. What am I talking about? There we go. <laughs> y1 as a function of x1. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. We do have that. So, um, coming up, and here it is. So I'll just write that equation, uh, sort of translate it. Uh, one will be hexane, and two will be cyclohexane. So the mole fraction of hexane in the vapor phase will be the uh, mole fraction of, hex, uh, of hexane in the liquid phase times the vapor pressure of hexane pure 
divided by uh, go away the um, vapor pressure of um, pure hexane minus the vapor pressure of pure cyclohexane times the mole fraction of hexane plus uh, the uh, vapor pressure of pure cyclohexane. Put those numbers in. Let's see, mole fraction of hexane was uh, 0 0.25. Vapor pressure, pure hexane, 115.5. I'll omit the units. Uh, down here we have, er, sorry, it wasn't 115, it's 151. Um, 151.4 over, and the difference in vapor pressure is 151.4 minus 77.6 times the mole fraction of hexane, 0 0.25, uh, plus uh, the vapor pressure per cycle hexane, 77.6, so this comes out to be 0.61. So note that the um, mole fraction of hexane in the uh, liquid phase is 0.25, but the mole fraction of hexane in the vapor phase is 0.61. Is that what we expect? Well, yeah, hexane has a bigger vapor pressure, so you would think that would have a bigger contribution uh, to the vapor phase than cyclohexane. Uh, which is less volatile. So that seems to check out. All right, so that ends this part of the lecture. And uh, if you're still uh, with us, we'll try uh, for the next part of this uh, lecture 11.